welcome to the Agile BI podcast, where we chat with guests or sometimes just to ourselves about being agile with teams who are delivering data, analytics, and visualization. Welcome to the Agile BI Podcast. I'm Shane Gibson. I'm Blair Tempero. And today it's just Blair and me having a chat about something that uh, we're excited about. So Blair, I think we're going to talk about the kind of journey you're going through at the moment of increasing the maturity in your organization around product owners. Yeah, that's right, Shane. So um, so we've been Agile for about three years now, maybe more. Um, you lose count. Uh, so we've got really good at... Uh, at having a development team using Agile, Scrum Masters are all up to speed. We've got a management structure that supports us in information. So uh, the one thing that we really have had to deal with is the business catching up with us. So we've found ourselves actually being the drivers of information products, we, and we take someone from the business along for the ride, and they would be a product owner with one hat and that will also have a day job. So we found that, you know, for the start of our evolution, that was fine, but we we needed to hand over a bit of the, the reins to the business to get them to start actually leading for the, from the front. So product ownership became a focus. And it was during one of these podcasts that I came across a, an awesome product owner coach and the penny dropped that, you know, we we need to get someone in that's got the expertise to coach product owners to um, show them the value of, of actually leading the the um, you know leading the development, um, and taking a bit of the bit of the um, responsibility off the scrum master to groom the backlog and to um, you know have, lead the direction of the development. So, so were you finding that the and the, the chasm of not having strong product owners available, the Scrum Master was kind of filling the role of a proxy product owner yes, to, to help the team get across the line? Absolutely. So um, I was the first Scrum Master uh, and found that I was actually prompting the development team to sort out the, the value stream mapping, you know, the current state and what's the most important thing to do at this stage without having the business input into, um, well, actually, this this function is really important because it will save us X number of um, FTEs, X number of hours. None of that analysis was actually been done. We were almost picking the, the low-hanging fruit. Okay, this will get us off to a really good start. This is, you know, following on from that, that seems logical. So none of that actual value was being um, analysed. So, so almost a... Uh a build it and they will come. Absolutely, yep. But because there were no strong product owners coming out of the organisation, so it must have been a choice of do nothing or have a guess of where that value is and deliver it and, and then see, yeah. see whether you hit the target. Yeah. yeah, so do nothing wasn't an option because we wanted to get on a roll um, and we did actually have some, some product owners who were naturally good and they did care about the product, and they were. And we found that, um, you know, with the, the trial and error of, of who was going to be product owner, um, just by just an organic um, find was that if they had skin in the game, then they were going to be a good product owner. At least they they were going to be able to help a proxy to um, make those good calls. So, so your team's a data analytics dev team, right? So, yeah. so they're not doing web development. They're not, you know, they're, not, they're, they're focused purely on data and analytics and visualizations. Yes. Did you find that influenced the availability of product owners somewhat? They're actually finding product owners that were data literate, interested in how, um, getting something built, you know, information product built that had data and, and analytics available to help make business decisions. Yeah. Did you find that made it harder or easier to find product owners? Well, it definitely we found it hard to, to find the, the data literacy aspect up front. Um, 
so that's where we kind of filled in the void in our, in our development team and, uh, and really led along the product data. But the strong ones that had data savviness and knew what the, uh, the development was replacing because they had a myriad of spreadsheets that they wanted to mold into a BI product, for instance. Um, yeah, it was a mixed bag. Um, am I that? Yeah, yeah. So, so when you kicked off, and I'm sure it's five or six years ago, you guys started this journey. Uh, uh, five, Time flies when yeah, you Yeah, it does. Um, you know, you did have some strong product donors kind of coming out of out of those business organizations or business groups. Yeah. Um, and I just assumed what would happen if there was a, a dearth of new product donors being made available that those people would would keep fulfilling the role of product donor, yeah. prioritizing the areas that had massive value to them and their parts of the organization. So they were just constantly getting freebies, right? That they yeah. were driving because nobody else was standing up and saying, hey, I need something as well. But it sounds like, did they leave? Did they back off? What, what happened there? Let's throw a restructure into ah. the mix. Let's throw a big restructure into right. the mix where um, the, the pioneers of our product ownership moved into different roles. We also wanted, consciously wanted to share the share the, um, the love around and make sure that we had you know, a wide variety of product owners. Um, yeah, but, but, but we didn't have a dedicated product owner in any of our previous developments where that, that's totally their hand. So it's quite interesting because if you, if you think about a dev team, you know, a, a scrum team or a, a team like that, um, what I find is that you know, when you start your agile journey, lots of investment around you know, new ways of working, potentially you know, should we be good coaching as well, um, but you kind of make that investment and then uh, you know, the team get a certain level of velocity and you can kind of back off some of that, that, that investment in that area. Um, but with a team, they often seem to, you know, people will leave, new people come in and have been through their journey, so they're starting from zero. And so there always seems to need to be, uh, you know, almost top up the tank again to, to help keep that velocity or accelerate to the next level. I hadn't kind of thought about it from a product ownership point of view, but what you're, you're saying is the same kind of thing, right? You kind of settle off, build that capability, and then over time, for a whole raft of reasons, it's slowly degraded and you needed to reinvest in bringing that capability back up to yep. to speed and potentially accelerate it to the to the next level. Yeah, so that sort of proved that not only the velocity was impacted on change within the development team, but yeah, product data can really affect that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you find that when we move in, because we, we didn't keep the team together to build um, numerous products, we would have that team specifically for that product. Right. And then we would break that up right. so, and then form another team with the resources available, go searching for a product donor. Um, no one was knocking on the door. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. We had a list of priorities from the business, yep. but none of it had this person is going to love it and own it. Right. Hence the, the um, you know, the idea that we needed to uh, focus more on the product ownership development. Cool. So what what's the first thing you did to, to start that focus? Right, so the first thing we did was um, obviously introduce her to the team. Mm -hmm. So so bring a coach in. Bring the coach to, in. To help you kind of invest in, in changing the level of maturity around That's product right. ownership. Yep. Um, so we had a plan to go top down. Mm -hmm. So we so I booked a number of sessions with um, the C-suite. So we, we got into level three management. So the, the product manager coach gave a, a skill to that group. But then we slowly moved down. So we um, then talked to individual teams within the business and their team leads. Um, just a part of the scene. So, so obviously hitting the C-suite first to get permission and, and endorsement That's right. to go to the next level and say, we're doing this, we have the backing of, of you know, the people above you, so, you know, you're not at opt out, this is, this is what we're doing. That's so, right. So, not, not mandating it, but not asking for permission. That's great. Yeah. And we didn't have a product yet right. to develop, so we were using that time to, to build our own capabilities in product ownership coaching. So that was, that was one of the um, key objectives. And, and, and the other one is, 
when you when you move from the C suite to the next level down, as you move down the organisational roles or hierarchy, did the messaging change slightly? Did the way you presented to the C level of what this is and why it's important and how it works, did it did it kind of change as you went lower and lower? Well, with the C suite, it's, it's you know you're selling an improvement to the business. Uh, you're doing that to the lower level as well, but it's more about this is how you do product ownership. You, you know, you sell that to the C-suite, but it's also what are, what are they going to get out of it is the first question that they'll ask. And it's that you'll get somebody that will really know the product inside and out is quicker. You know, you'll get something deliverable a lot quicker if somebody's there to make those, those big calls. Um, and... Yeah, as we got to the lower level, it's, it's, it was more about, um, you know, the functions of the product owner. We've got them to value stream mapping, what, how to prioritise what, you know, what task or what benefit to build in what order. Um, and got into more about how the product owner fits into the development team, how that whole um, scrum team fits in. Fits in. So it's, Cool. So, so what I'm kind of hearing is, is uh, when you start at the top, you start off with a conversation of why, why we're we doing this, why would we do this, what's you know, where's the value? Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah. At some stage, that why will start becoming backed up by the what, right? So, why are we doing this? We want to improve you know the way the organisation works or the value or whatever. Um, what are we going to do? Oh, you know, we've, we've got this thing called product owner, this is what it is. And so a bit of a framework around the, the what it is. Yeah. And then as you get lower and lower on sharing, that you you then move into the how. So you, right. you quick why, bit more of the what, and then lots of detail the how. How does it work? What tools do yeah. we use? What are the process? So that, yeah. so that kind of why, what, and then how as you go down yeah. and, and to more details. Quite yeah, a nice and the C-suite also wanted to know how quick market you get or right. how so, so we saw the idea of the um, continuous improvement or the um, the iteration, um, so that you'll get something in sprint one, you'll also get something in sprint two. Mm-hmm. So it's really selling the idea that you'll start to see benefits straight away. Uh, we might go away for six months, build our requirements document, and come back and see you again. Yeah, so it's really the it was the agile versus waterfall like. So, sales pitch. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, Gave waterfall a bit of a hiding. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, um, I was at a meetup, uh, so an agile coaching meetup um, a little while ago, and um, what was interesting there was this idea that we shouldn't bag waterfall because, you know, for certain ways of working, waterfall is actually fit for purpose. That's right. Yeah. Um, but we all do it. Well, I don't actually rephrase it. I'm not sure we all do it. Lots of us, and I'm yeah, I'm There's one two of in this room that probably do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's it's because for I don't know, even but for me, I found a, in, in the environment that I'm in around data and analytics, I find agile is a better way than waterfall. That's <clears> right. Um, potentially, you know, in 20 more years, there'll be a new thing comes out that's better than agile or mm-hmm. a refined version. But um, given agile is a mindset, not an approach, I actually don't think. You know, the, the mindset will change, maybe the tools and techniques we use will. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so started like start off with an education process, right? To to, to go through and, and, and as you said, sell the vision. That's right. Um, and then then we started to um, bring her into some of the existing developments. We had a couple of couple of projects going at the time that uh, had proxy product owners. So it's it's that observation stage where we would get feedback on, you know, are we really that broken? Um, what's going well? What's not? Doing some learnings on, on our existing methodology or the way that we were doing that product ownership role, you know, taking that feedback and starting to build a, a plan from for the next development, how we do it differently. So kind of a retrospective on the on the go. Okay, so observe, retro, experiment with new new ways of working. That's and right. Try them, see if they improve. Uh, That's right. So uh, it was around that stage where we got an opportunity to step into a new um, BI product development. So 
So we really chunked up the, the product ownership side. So we had a brand new product owner. We had a we had the coach that we've brought in. We've also got a we had a trainee product owner coach and also a very experienced PA wrapped around the the new product owner. So we really beefed that side up, um, which slowed it down to start with, but um, we were ready for that pain. And then we had, on the other side, we had the, the developer and, the, and another VA. Yeah, and we had some learnings from that as well. We were about to have a retrospective. Yeah, the product side was coming along nicely. They were learning new things. They were going away to, to the business, to the users, and we started to introduce um, user experience to, to the mix. We've never had that in the product owner side. Yeah. We had developers waiting, waiting for that UX to start. So, so it sounds like you kind of split the team though, right? So previously you had a proxy product owner that was kind of embedded in the Scrum team. So the Scrum team were connecting with the stakeholders around what they want you know, getting understanding of, you know, the, the epics, the user stories, the features, uh, understanding, you know, what success looked like, the search criteria, all those kind of things. Um, and then you introduced the role of, you, you kind of accelerate or mature, tried to focus on maturing the role of the product owner. But it sounds to me that you almost create a product management, product owner group that went in early, understood all that, and then came back to the yeah, dev yeah. team. So... How did, how did that work? It didn't didn't work particularly well. Um, so we we kind of um, put all of our focus on that on the product owner side, and that's probably a rookie mistake. Um, we won't do certainly won't do that again. And for me, it showed the importance of of the scrum master role, and it's to keep that whole team tight. So we did find that we slipped away. Do you think it's because? Um yeah, you brought in an external coach to help build some capability, do some observation and area, find out areas of, of areas you could improve or accelerate. So therefore, because that was an external person coming in and there was an investment to get that done, and, and no doubt that was time-bound, that all your energy and focus went on improving that side of the yep. equation. Yep. And so you naturally lighten the other side because you potentially could fix it later or actually you don't realise that it's imbalanced. Yeah, and also I th on the um, on the product owner side, we we still didn't have a dedicated product owner with a hundred percent of with her time. So and they were also going through a restructure and her role was being redefined. So she, so um, it's also the pains of trying to do something different that well, if I if you remember what I mentioned earlier, we would drive the development and we would go ahead and we'd build it based on what we think the product owner wants. Um, so we lost a lot of momentum because we were waiting for that side to come to the party. Um, and they were growing pains that I, I suspected would, would happen because you're actually saying, hey, we're going to wait for you to come to us. And that's an unnatural um, behaviour for the for our development So. But if you waited for the perfect storm, if you waited for, you know, the, the change in that business part of the organisation to stop and, and everybody to settle and, and be, you know, mature, and mm. that never happens, right, because change is constant. So yeah. so it's always, in my view, you know, you, you had an awareness of the uncertainty and the risk of doing it now, yeah. but waiting probably may or may not have reduced the uncertainty yeah, but it wouldn't have helped increase the value of what the dev team's building. No. So just do it and it's manage the risk experiment to, yeah. to say, um, no, let's hold back. Let's wait for them to come. It's us and them. Mm -hmm. Let's wait for them to come to us and push us. It didn't work because it's it's just just a totally different mindset mm -hmm. for for, for this, the business side. And there were literally developers waiting earnestly for, for the product owner to uh, come to the party. But yeah, they got grumpy. Yep. 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 And you know what I said? I know you were going to be grumpy. Yep. But I'm sorry that, you know, we are trying to beef up this side of the side of the development. Uh, bear with us. Mm -hmm. Don't rush ahead and make assumptions. So that's what we've done in the past. And I think, 
you know, if you were going to try the, you know, if you were going to do this type of experimentation in, in, in your own organization, um, you have to be very clear with uh, the people that are, you know, driving the change in the organization and, and being that, you know, shit umbrella to keep you safe that actually the, the velocity and the throughput that's coming out of the dev team is markedly going to go down yep. uh, because we kind of need to unlearn or break the current behavior to increase our maturity on the product owner side, yep. which will give us that, that buy-in and velocity and, and make sure we do the right things, yep. not just do something uh, in the future, right? So you have to have that permission to, to yeah, yeah to, to be able to do that or you won't be safe. Yeah, true. Yeah, and in hindsight, I don't think we would have done anything differently on the product side, but I would have made the development so I feel safer. And okay, so so first of all, you know, explain the why, then the what, then the how, and do the education to, to get everybody ready to start that journey. Yep. Second step, coach helps understand where you're at, where we can improve, bit of a retro, start baking in some experimentation and the ways we're working and consistently retroing on that to improve and iterate and, and, and do that. Yep. And then for me, I suppose the, the next logical step would be having that ability to carry on that behavior without the external coach. So yeah, yeah. being able to onboard new product owners, be able to have uh, somebody internal in your organization that is assuming the role of product owner coach or product owner of product owners or, or whatever you want to call it. So yeah. have you got to that stage? Yeah, so we had... Every intention was to be to have the product coach come in to be a, um, to train the trainer. Mm-hmm. So we were never filling a void that needed something that needed fixing quickly. Hey, we need a product owner to build this. It's more about building those capabilities. So we've built up a um, catalog of, of documentation on how we will train the next product owner, and we'll put them through that school before we even start the development so that's going to be one non-negotiable from the development side is that product owner needs to come past this past this um, training so who do you think is going to do that who, who's going to be the person in your organization or the, the role that helps on board and mentor and, and train and some of them might say some of your team yeah, yeah yeah so so the business development team is to work alongside product. So we'll try and be the center of, center of excellence for, for Agile. Right. So we'll we'll supply the, the product owner coaching as well as giving Scrum Masters and Agile BAs to projects. Okay. Um, yeah, so they'll come to us. Um, yep, so we've got we've got a product owner coach. We're, we're finishing off our time with the uh, yeah, with the external contractor. Uh, Got a few more hours of support, and yeah, just wait for that next development. And I think you know, again, retro on this one is actually booking out that in a certain period of time, six months a year, you need to bring that coach back in for another short period of observe feedback. Yeah. You know, identify areas of experimentation to accelerate your internal coaching team to the next level. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see what, where we've gone in six months. Yeah. Again, you know, you probably don't need an external, right? What you need is is we use the externals as a way of us forcing the investment of that time or, or typically that money which forces us to put the investment of time. Actually, if we looked at uh, the coaching team that you're developing, if we said rather than the technical debt sprint like we do with developers, mm-hmm. we're going to do a way of working acceleration iteration where the coaching team actually stop working on on a development or, or that and actually spend an iteration themselves figuring on you know doing the retros to themselves and observing each other yeah. uh, is figuring out what's next then actually it becomes an internal process for the way of working because you're focusing on investing that time yeah, to make that change, so keep a band together. Yeah, while you're waiting for the next product development opportunity. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because for me in my head, as, as I thought about it, is bring the expert in, 
and that has massive value, but there's that secondary value by by investing in that money you effectively invest in that time, by giving yourself permission to invest that time, uh, would, would you get the same benefit? Mm, yeah. yeah, probably an interesting experimentation. Yeah, well, we, well, we are experimenting. Yeah. We? yeah, well, we're the, so we'll continue to, uh, to build up the backlog of product owners that we've got in the business that we can probably train so that they sort of form an alumni. Uh, we've already got that to a certain degree with the uh, product owners that we've got through the league, but with less formal training, um, you know, that they will mentor new product owners coming on, but this is just beefing it up that extra level. Yeah, so I've, I've done a little bit of work um, looking at what, what's called the Spotify model, although there's a big argument about whether it's a model or not. Um, and so that has a, the concept of uh, squads, teams, chapters, and guilds and then tribes, so, and, and they cross over, so it's not a hierarchy, it's a, it's a matrix. Yeah. Um, I really like the idea they have of, of chapters more around your know, skill sets, they might have an engineering chapter, or you might, and then a guild becomes a, a, a group of people that have a similar interest. Right. Um, and, and I'm wondering whether that's effectively where you're going to end up with, is you know, your version of an alumni. Is really a product owner guild yep. where if you're interested in product ownership, you know you have that like-minded people together, and then the, the question I suppose is how do you encourage that? How do you reinforce that? Is that you know a product owner one day get together with you know an own conference or a conference where you again you're giving permission for people to invest their time in growing that guild? Well, the uh we were at at the moment is that the business has a job advertised for an experienced product owner. So hopefully that's the start of the business actually beefing up that side of things and they will form, form a guild, will actually be a functional team of product owners that will work on multiple products um, and they will come to us and say, hi, right, this is Joe, he's going to be the product owner for this development. And be up to that product owner to do research on what they're actually building and, and doing the UX and doing the stakeholder engagement, but coming from an experience point of view rather than, yeah, us doing all the driving. So it's going to be really good. Cool. Yeah. So close it out. What any other other words of wisdom from what you've learned over no, the last I'm, couple of months? I'm just looking forward to the. Um, conflict between Scrum Master and Product Owner that we've never had. <laughs> Hopefully it's a <our> collaboration <laughs> with a little bit more of a, you oh, know, yeah. a separation of role or responsibility or accountability yeah. uh, but still closely working together. <laughs> that would be nice to see. Your words, your words are better. <laughs> I'm just looking for that natural, um, that natural sort of um, intertwining of ideas. I don't know articulate it, but we want a product owner that's going to push our team, right? We've never had that. Because like, your, your scrum masters are good scrum masters, right? They're yeah. servient leaders for the team that are making the team healthy and, and helping the team grow, but by doing that, they're not naturally going to take a, a business for your value, which is, you know, I want more, I want more. I, no, yeah. you can't not deliver that because I, I really need it. So, yeah. so they're quite rightly behaving like good scrum masters. No, I think that's a shame. Um, I mean, this is an evolving thing, but I'd love to have a chat about, let's say, a few months down the track and see how we go. Uh, I'll have some success stories, hopefully, and some more learnings. Yeah, look, let's put that one in, and, uh, and uh, the same for maybe, uh, I don't know, Podcast 24. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, that's a lot from us, so catch you later. See you later.